Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Todd from CASI headquarters and welcome to Earth Observations 3 on day two of Astro 2021. Our uh, session chair uh, is having a, some technical difficulties at the moment, so I'm going to just step in uh, and uh, just kind of run things until things are worked out. And we uh, are going to skip our first presentation and we're going to move directly to our second presentation. So, uh, Jeff, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself, I will share the screen so that people can see what's going on and I will fade into the background. Thank you, Todd. My name is Jeff Burbage. I'm from Airbus Defence and Space in Portsmouth, UK. Just checking you can hear me, Todd. So can I just get confirmation? Uh, I, can, so okay? I can. When I'm running your presentation, I can't actually see this. Sorry, I was muted. I can. Everything's great. Good. Go ahead. Thank, thanks very much. Lovely. Okay. Thanks very much, Todd. So, uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about terrestrial snow mass mission um, and the key fe features of the so called Explorer mission concept. Um, uh, as I say, I'm from Airbus in the UK, and we've been leading a study on this activity for the last four years. Thanks. Next slide, please, Todd. So, I'll cover some background um, to the history of the project, the scientific basis for how we're here, the objectives and some of the requirements that we are working to, and then go through the concepts and the selected concept that we are taking forward, um, and then summarise with the achievements and the conclusions. Thank you. So the history of terrestrial snow mass mission goes, goes a little way back. It's, uh, I guess, around mid-2000. 15 time when Environment and Climate Change Canada, along with the Canadian Space Agency, uh, initiated a few activities driven, I guess, by the science need for measurement of snow water equivalent um, as a key scientific parameter for where there is currently a significant observational gap. Um, we in Airbus um, have been doing firstly a pre-phase zero study and then subsequently a phase zero project um, uh, for the CSA and for the Environment and Climate Change Canada client um, and with the involvement of a science team that's shared by the, the, the Environment Canada science lead, uh, Dr Chris Dirksen. Um, we've been running with that, uh, those two studies, as I say, over the last four or five years. Um, we have been supported by Canadian partners uh, within our contractor team and most recently on the phase zero we we led a team that involved support from particular Canadian organisations, including Seacor, Magellan, and H2O Geomatics, to support our activities. In parallel with the the study work that we've been doing on mission concept and mission definition level, there have been some technology development activities that have been running under the Space Technology Development Program, which have been helping to advance some of the technology readiness levels of, of some elements within the architecture um, to de-risk the program and to progress some technology building blocks. So in summary, to begin with, we, TSMM is a, is a candidate for a future Canadian EO science mission uh, and, as I say, addressing some key observational gaps in snow monitoring. Next slide, thanks. So. Here I'm leaning heavily on, on Chris Dirksen and colleagues in the science domain and, and stealing a little bit of his, uh, his important summary slides, I think, on the scientific rationale. And, and, and we always characterise it in the way of, of the importance of seasonal snow. And, and this comes down to the fact that snow is such a critical resource covering so many different domains and its role, particularly in terms of a freshwater resource, um, can't be understated. It's also obviously quite critical in relation to natural hazards and, and flooding. But it is volatile um, and subject to huge variability. And, and the graphic on the right shows some of the measurement uncertainties that exist in terms of the amount of snow mass through different existing satellite-based measurement uh, sources. So there's there's great uncertainty and it's, it's very sensitive. Um, um, that there's a great um, unknown in relation to the measurement um, certainty. So what is SWE? SWE is the 
essentially the water that is stored within snowmass. It's a critical parameter in the, in the science of, of those applications. And we don't get enough information about how it's quantified or its geospatial location um, through current sources of remote sensing. And, and current observational techniques, be they in situ ground measurements or other techniques, really don't address the science need. Um, on top of that, there have been improvements in the way that snow has been modelled over recent years, and, and now we, it's quite clear we need some different approach in terms of coupling both the observations and the modelling and the remote sensing techniques in order to answer, as, as the graphic on the right shows, two key questions. What are, um, and, and I guess, themes, needs, and then the ultimate science benefit is is what, what does it mean for climate services and water availability and, and how does it feed into um, predictions and operational forecasting um, so that we can address the question of how much water is stored in, in seasonal snow and what is the contribution of that snow to the water cycle. Uh, next slide, please. The next slide really just emphasises the same point is that snow is going to become an even more critical environmental parameter as glacial areas disappear and freshwater supply is impacted. Um, it, it is, as I, as I said, a significant influence on spring flood events. And again, we need more information in order to help with those hydrological predictions. And possibly most significantly for some of our study work, the, the products that we currently have in terms of measurement of snow water equivalent are quite coarse. Um, and are not really what is needed for the science um, to, to be to be more robust. So the motivation in some of the requirements in this study have pushed us towards uh, different resolution products and different coverage requirements in order to help with the retrieval process and to help with the modelling. So um, clearly, Environment and Climate Change Canada see this aspect as being a critical um, priority and, and and snow mass is, is right up there in terms of, of improving our measurement capabilities. Thank you. Next slide. So we've been working within the industrial team to, to respond to some high level mission objectives that have been collectively defined by the agency and by Environment Canada. Um, primarily it's about SWE measurement. Um, um, and also the state of that that uh, that snowpack, um, and a secondary measurement is also to take benefit from the measurement tools that we have through through the, the solution we're proposing to monitor sea ice both in terms of type and extent, melt on shape and onset um, sea ice um, permanent ice, and also some ocean wind parameters where that's feasible. So we have been following a set of derived radar parameters, because this is a radar mission, I should, should come to that shortly, um, to um, to shape and to influence the the solution that we've derived. And, and, and it's worth saying that over the course of the pre-phase zero and phase zero work, we initially traded off different um, architectures and system solutions, including different bands, but ultimately that led to the understanding that KU band is, is a, is a uh, favoured solution and dual frequency KU band is the best um, mechanism by which we actually make detailed measurements measurements of SWE, uh, address the volume scattering issues that exist within dry snow, um, and allow us to through the sense the different sensitivities of two different frequency bands in in the thirteen point five and seventeen point two gigahertz range, um, allow us to make. Um, retrievals that that give us information about the snow microstructure and therefore allow us to to return the parameters that the scientific uh, teams are looking for. Next slide, please. So it, it's worth um, focusing on the fact that there's there's a history here of what we did within the pre-phase zero and the phase zero over the, that period, and 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 it started with looking at a full operational mission in response to the mission requirements. Um, and we developed that concept through both the pre-phase zero and into the phase zero study. And, and it, was, it was a substantial 
and SAR solution. Um, it was following and, and driven by the specification that we had. And we came up with, a, I think, quite an innovative body-mounted SAR antenna concept um, that was, although relatively small in size, it, it met all of the um, technical requirements in terms of the measurement objectives and, and observational requirements and followed a, an approach in terms of, of both quality and, and programmatics that was in line with what we would normally expect for a full institutional program. It had, as, as, we, as we defined it at the time, a, um, a mission life year, um, a mission a lifetime of six years, and we were working towards a, a program um, um, life cycle that would deliver a launch capability at the back end of the decade. What we then evolved this to with, with the guidance and advice of our customer was, was a, an explorer mission concept, which was a reduced concept. Thank you. Um, which which looked at how we could take the different view on this and be, take a slightly more low cost design to cost philosophy, potentially, I say compromising, but but looking at where there were some aspects on the operational and observational requirements that we might be able to compromise a little bit um, in order to come up with a more efficient solution. Um, so we've taken that through, and, and and I mentioned here that we followed a similar. Um, design philosophy and, and development philosophy to the one that we achieved on the Novasar 1 SAR mission. So it follows some similar principles there. And, and therefore, um, that facilitated a slightly more new space type approach to, to, the, to the project. Um, obviously, uh, sort of cutting a few corners in terms of the whole um, programmatics, but still delivering on a, a, a highly capable and powerful instrument and and um but bringing it to fruition in a shorter time scale so potentially in, as things stood in a launch time scale of 2026 but with a shorter mission life and, and this was therefore to facilitate some initial capability and validation of the the tssm measurement so that that explorer mission is something that's been taken forward as a candidate for the next stage of the tssm program approval thank you next slide so the next two slides will just detail a little bit more about the Explorer concept, um, focusing on, on the things that, that characterize it. Um, I, I, perhaps the, the main thing to mention, apart from it being a dual frequency KU band SAR, is that it's also a single aperture. So it's a shared single aperture in which both frequency bands are transmitted. That's helpful because obviously the size of a, of a synthetic aperture radar antenna is often the, the driver on, on, on lots of things, including the implementation, the complexity and the cost. So we developed a solution that was based on a, a smaller antenna size than we had for the original operational mission, um, driven by those boundary conditions. And that uh, it gave us the opportunity to, to still deliver uh, something like a 250 kilometer imaging swath, which, which translates to complete coverage of Canada over every five days. A nominal resolution of 500 meters, spatial resolution before looks, but also an, a, a higher resolution mode of 50 meters as well, which we could use for, for specific uh, areas of, of interest and, and, and to address certain applications. The baseline for the system gives us a fairly high around orbit duty cycle, around 25%. Uh, and, and through various trade-offs, we ended up with a seven-day repeat orbit as being favoured. And as I mentioned, it's a two-year mission that would potentially cover three winter seasons for that initial um, validation. Um, thank you, yeah, we'll stay on that slide. Um, so yeah, just to the key points on the right is that we then focus down the the um, the requirements for the rest of the study to be um, tailored towards the operational mission requirements, which, as I say, were a small compromise on the original mission objectives, but still delivered really really powerful products. Next slide, thank you. Um, so, obviously, the the um, the activities that we were doing were focused on what observational capability can we achieve of, of an area of, of scientific interest in terms of snow? And there was a, a clearly defined snow mask, as shown in some of the graphics there, for, for snow areas that are, that are being imaged, um, both in the Northern Hemisphere winter and, and the Southern Hemisphere as well. So, but we focus on the Northern and you can see the physical or the geographical areas of interest. We have the coverage and, and revisit requirements were defined over that region of, 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 of interest. Um, 
and and this this system solution through the use of the 250 kilometer swaths in the course resolution modes um, but also the the higher resolution modes for some high priority areas gave a very interesting and very powerful coverage capability across across that region of interest and we we achieved um, or exceeded most of the observational um, threshold requirements um, in the Explorer um, concept. Um, um, the, the trades, we, you know, through the trades, we looked at different orbital options in sun synchronous orbit around 500 kilometers altitude and then came came up to some optimized solutions that, that seemed to give us the best possible compromise between coverage and repeat cycle. And, and at this point, I should uh, acknowledge the support of CCOR on, on a lot of the uh, mission analysis and the observational analysis that you're seeing in those graphics today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the actual SAR payload and the, the architecture, um, obviously we're, we're driven, driven by a demanding requirement for this reduced precursor mission, but but we, we've taken a similar solution and approach, as I said, to the one that we implemented successfully on Novasar One. The baseline was reuse of of the back end electronics that we had for Novasar One, but adapted as required for this mission. Um, and on the front end side of things, obviously this is a KU band um, SAR instrument that requires some some new technology, some different technologies in terms of of how KU band. Um, operates both in terms of the active and passive elements and we have a a planar array antenna that's about 2.5 meters by 0.8 meters in, in uh, dimensions uh, in, in length and, and height with 32 elevation centers giving us a, a scan cell capability across track but just one azimuth face center even though there's three physical columns in the antenna and the arrangement had 96 um, um, TR modules and 192 subarrays um, in terms of its physical architecture, um, and 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 quite quite usefully we, we scale this such that it has a commonality of of the building block with that with that which would be needed for the operational mission. Uh, and as I said, some of these technologies are being being supported and developed under the SDD pre program. Next slide, please. Uh, so just briefly, obviously, the radiometric performance of all these um, SAR modes is the key thing, and it determines the, the, the viability of the, of the observations in terms of returning the science, and it's the typical parameters of sensitivity, the noise equivalent sigma zero, and, and the ambiguity ratios, along with the spatial and other radiometric parameters. So we, we delivered, as I say, a 250-kilometer swath uh, in the 500-meter mode resolution and a 28-kilometer swath in the 50-meter resolution mode, both through scansar modes, covering a fairly broad instance angle range from 25 to 46 degrees. Um, but compared to, off, to, 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 I guess, um, typical SAR missions, this is quite coarse resolution, but we appreciate this is tailored to a particular application and only needs a coarse resolution. But as a result, it doesn't produce a huge data rate. And the power budgets and data handling budgets associated with it, with it are relatively modest, as indicated, um, uh, both in the 500 meter mode and then in the 50 meter mode. So this helps facilitate the, the fairly substantial around orbit duty cycles that we're proposing, which are listed in the table on the left, and a potential operational balance between how much you use in the 500 meter mode and the 50 meter mode. Which, which I think was interesting to the science team in terms of how they could operationally phase um, both modes. Okay, next slide, thanks. Uh, on the platform side of things, we are uh, on a um, Falcon 9 rideshare, taking advantage of the, the economy of that. Um, as I say, it's in a fairly low altitude, 505 kilometers. Um, the satellite mass derived was was less than 500 kilos and, and again that, that ties in with the Falcon 9 rush air. Um, we were trying to use some COPS equipment hardware where possible or reuse of existing qualified equipments to reduce cost. Uh, it has an X-band payload downlink and an S-band uplink. Uh, a modest solar array area um, um, uh, factored into the constraints of the configuration that we can see within the accommodation. And, and a decoupled thermal architecture between the payload and the platform um, to try and reduce issues in that respect. Um, 
the architecture is single string in a number of areas with, with, with minimal redundancy reflecting the nature of the mission, um, but with graceful degradation within the antenna because of the different TR uh, modules and face centers we have. So there's a certain graceful redundancy, graceful degradation redundancy at that level. Next slide, thank you. Oh, and I should credit there that the Magellan were responsible for all aspects of the platform um, concept and development. So coming to the conclusion and just wrapping up with the achievements. So at the end of the phase zero and, and the succession of studies that we've done, we, we've certainly derived and refined a number of mission concepts, including most recently the Explorer. We've looked at um, the options in terms of how mission performance could be delivered to maximize the science, and but also driven significantly by the concept of coming up with a reduced cost um, um, shorter mission implementation cycle consistent with a, a I guess a, a demonstrator type um, um, deployment. Um, we explored the observational capabilities of what that would deliver in terms of products and did a number of trades about how that could be optimized to meet the customer needs um, and we set up a um, internally, I guess, a, a, a quite a significant review of the programmatic framework for how we would deliver such a mission. Uh, reviewed that and uh, and got that through our internal uh, processes for uh, endorsing the fact that we could do this as a, as a essentially a low cost demonstrator mission. Um, and yeah, we also did some work on developing some consolidated mission system requirements that would allow us to uh, to frame the next step of the uh, of the program. So we've ended up with a reference concept, a reference definition, and as I said earlier, it's a strong candidate for going through into a next phase of development and implementation. Um, next slide, I think I've just got a summary. So yeah, just, just stepping back to the original um, raison d'etre is uh, really there is a gap in terms of snow mass and snow water equivalent measurements, and, and it really feeds heavily into environmental monitoring and forecasting and, and is a natural hazards issue um, in relation to flooding. So this is a, a fairly directly um, derived mission concept that targets that particular application domain. Um, the improved accuracy and temporal measurement that we get from the modes that we're, we, we've defined in relation to this mission do make a significant difference in how we would measure and model snow, uh, and it can't really be addressed by other measurement techniques or other systems. So we hope that the products and the data that would come from a TSMM Explorer would, would certainly feed into significant improvements in hydrological and weather prediction, and obviously then also bring downstream benefits in terms of what that would mean by, by that, this improved data source and feeding into the mitigation of, of natural hazards um, and all the consequences that would go with that. Um, we'd like to thank the TSMM customer team and the client team in, in CSA and Environment Canada for working with us and the opportunity to develop the mission over, over the last few years. And also, of course, to acknowledge the contributions that we have from our partners and, and suppliers in, in the team uh, in Canada, both industrial and academic, who, who contributed to the studies. And I think the last slide is just an acknowledgement of some of the people involved in that and the science team who uh, who sat behind uh, behind Chris as well. Thanks very much. That's me. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Jeff. Uh, let me just unshare the screen here for me. There we go. That was uh, that was a lot of information for me to try and keep up with as I was changing your slides. <laughs> Everything was great. It's a lot of information. Is there are there any uh, comments or questions here? We have one question from Chris Dodd is asking, what is the potential for international collaboration on TSMMM? That's a good question, Chris. Um, I think there is there's a lot of potential. We we also looked at putting the um, TSMM concept into previous Earth Explorer um, proposals into the ESA framework, and 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 Chris Dirksen, who's the lead PI, has a close relationship also with FMI in Finland, and 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 
that is also a, 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 a an option. I suppose between Canada and Finland in terms of, of areas of snow interest, but I think it, it, there's always the possibility we could we could find a, a bilateral or multilateral arrangement for this from from nations who have an interest in snow, and I, I think certainly more recently there might be potential to tie up a little bit more with the US. Um, but yeah, there is there are options on a multilateral basis um, to to I guess collectively approach this rather than it being a, a, a Canadian only uh, venture um, because after all snow is a global issue um, and there are many countries who who would would also obviously value such a capability uh, to address similar issues in their areas. There are certainly. Thank you for your answer. If you have any more questions and you would like to ask Jeff something about his presentation, now is the time as we prepare for our next presenter. Is Jay Pablo here? It does not look like it. Peter, are you ready to make your presentation? Hello, yes I am. Hello. That would be great. Um, if you would like to go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, then just go right into your presentation. Sounds good. I'm just showing my screen. Uh, just a quick mic and video check. Can you see? Certainly can. And hear my screen? Great. Sure can. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Peter Barron. I'm a technical sales manager at Airbus Defense and Space Intelligence in North America. And today I'll be talking about how Airbus's very high resolution electro optical satellite constellation that we call Pleiades Neo or Pleiad Neo, also referred to it as P Neo during the presentation, is ushering in an exciting era for um, geospatial applications and services. So, this talk is designed to provide an overview of the P Neo constellation uh, capabilities. Um, Airbus has truly designed a, a an innovative next generation constellation for a promising future here. Uh, in, in our quick changing world, craving for more information, uh, next space is the logical continuation here. So with a pioneering partner like Airbus DS in, in space technology, um, a next generation constellation uh, of Play Neo, we're, we're positioned to deliver high quality imagery for various applications, uh, endless applications. Um, innovation, digitalization, technological prog progress are fund fundamentally transform whole industries, whole markets, and reshape uh, consumer demands. Uh, the society is in increasingly connected and needs more data, more services, more details, and more precision. Um, our ever-changing world insights are more important than ever uh, to make informed decisions. As space becomes easier to reach, uh, more connected, and more digitalized, it's more than ever a critical domain for lots of markets. Space data is key uh, to make decisions and solve real world problems. Uh, for example, space data is key for, for mapping, for planning purposes, monitoring needs, security and safety, emergency response, crisis management, situational awareness, environmental monitoring, so on and so on. Everyone knows all the great uses, I'm sure, by today. So massive data volumes, um, precise information and timelines are more and more crucial in this constantly changing world. That's why Airbus decided to kind of rewrite the rules and um, make a break in traditional technologies with this next space concept. At Airbus, we can offer our customers a wide range of end-to-end -end services across the, the space ecosystem from satellite imagery to full digital services. Um, and we rely on our know-how and, our, our know and expertise to deliver the future of space uh, to our customers and that's why we have um, kind of rewritten these rules we're, we're taking another big step by investing in next, next space by offering faster easier and more reliable uh, satellite imagery constellations and what we want is to be what what um, the market wants is to extract useful information and they want to see clearly what's happening on the ground from space so resolution and quality of the data is a is a must uh, moreover um, consistency and reliability in the pixel as well as large volumes allows to apply more and more algorithms to bring the value to extract the value out of the data and provide solutions um, several several types of sensors and systems can be required uh, be it an optical radar drone uh, ground-based terrestrial sensors or open source intelligence 
um, but as important as the data um, is to receive the information at the right time. We need to be reactive. We need to be able to order data at the last minute and receive it on time. So we're, we also need to monitor our areas of interest more frequently to follow the evolution and detect change. So lastly, we need to be able to access the information easily, but also in a secure way. Uh, the good news is, is that next space era has started and Pleiad, uh, Pleiad Neo is, is already a reality. It's, it's on orbit, at least the first two are. Um, the first step was achieved on April 28th of this year um, when Pleiades Neo 3 launched from the Guiana Space Center in Corral uh, on an Airbus Vega launcher. The second step was achieved on August 16th when the second Pleiades Neo satellite, uh, Pleiades Neo 4, um, launched from Corot, also on a Vega launcher. And so Pleiades Neo 3 and 4 are now delivering their first images as commercial operations started uh, this month. Um, Pleiades, Pleiades Neo 5 and 6, the, the third and fourth satellites, will be launching next summer for full operate, uh, full commercial operation of the, of the constellation um, in Q4 of 2022. So by the end of 2022, we'll have all four satellites on orbit. Um, the resources of these satellites are 100% commercially available, which is very important because this ensures that 30 centimeter resolution data supply for at least the next 10 years. Um, before we go into more details on Pleiad Neo, um, why Airbus? You know, we have extensive experience. Uh, we're, we're close to a lot of diverse customers and enables us to listen to their needs day to day. And so we can help them anticipate and respond to tomorrow's challenges. Um, Airbus's intelligence, the, the group I work for, the, the program line called Intelligence, is part of the Airbus Defense and Space um, Division, Europe's largest defense and space company. Our purpose is to improve life on Earth uh, through cutting edge space technologies. And with all the breakthroughs, we, we, we bring people closer together and we help solve global challenges on Earth. Um, we've been delivering value from data for more than 30 years, uh, since 1986, with the first spot uh, mission uh, back then it was Spot Image, the company, um, providing satellite products and systems at a various range of trusted customers and partners worldwide. So, therefore, Airbus, you know, we're constantly innovating, uh, devising our future constellations, our systems, our platforms, and services in order to accompany um, the market's decision making and help bringing these types of solutions. Um, and we know it's not kind of one size fits all matter. You know, our approach has always been to offer multi sensor multi-resolution, uh, multi-source data. Over more than 30 years, uh, we've built an unrivaled con constellation. Um, optical satellites ranging from 30 centimeter resolution with the arrival of Pineo up to 22 meter resolution uh, with the DMC constellation, uh, including our successful constellations of Pleiades 50 centimeter and Spot 1.5 meter, uh, as well as other partners. Um, we offer radar sensors, um, with a variable imaging mode from 40 meters all the way down to 25 centimeters with the TerraSRX, Tandem X, and PAWS satellites on orbit, and um, signal intelligence with partners like Hawkeye 360, uh, the RF being integrated into, into um, maritime and, and other really important services. And we always keep a step ahead on these future missions and assets um, on the horizon. Uh, like uh, Zephyr, a high altitude pseudo satellite that hasn't been fully commercialized, um, but can provide persistent surveillance. Um, and CO3D, which is a global 50 centimeter elevation service um, that's slated to start in 20, well, the mission is going to start in 2023 and take about two years to collect the entire global land mass at 50 centimeter to make DSMs and DTMs. Um, and a continuation program for radar with the TerraSRX Neo. Um, so in 2021, it really marks a turning point because we're changing the game and taking a giant leap here um, with, with Playad Neo. Um, let's take a quick look back at the history of Playad Neo. This project was born almost five years ago. Since then, we've gone through the design phases where we had to take uh, a fast learning approach and where we challenged ourselves to innovate uh, better and faster. So today we're we're literally in the future. You know, two of the four uh, identical agile satellites are in operation, offering reactive tasking, intraday revisit of any point on Earth. And PNEO is the first European 30 centimeter satellite constellation um, 
which capacity is entirely dedicated to the commercial market. Airbus is now offering the large, largest capacity of 30 centimeter imagery in the ops, Earth observation uh, market starting this year. So this, this uh, program was entirely funded, designed, uh, manufactured and uh, owned and operated by Airbus. And we faced a real technical challenge with a learn fast approach to create new technology and new design. Um, and the Constellation's been designed uh, for greater revisit, reactivity, 24-7 um, tasking, uh, and image availability uh, after uh, acquisition at high resolution. So let's take a look at some of the new features and the key benefits. Um, here you can see a Pleiad Neo image over Sydney Airport in Australia. Uh, you can clearly observe the lines in the taxiway and the, the vehicles in the car park here. Um, PNEO's instrument is an optical payload operating in a push broom acquisition mode, uh, allowing to provide 30 centimeter native resolution imagery uh, in panchromatic mode and the 1.2 meter resolution images in the multispectral channels. And it has a 14 kilometer swath. So this is a first rate um, commercial ground sampling distance combined with the highest performance uh, geolocation accuracy under five meter CE90. And this level of sensor quality allows um, our users to detect and then identify and recognize objects with, with a great level of detail and precision. Uh, this capability will also uh, help improve algorithms results and enable more automation with, with all the artificial intelligence and machine learning applications um, that are blossoming in the industry. Um, in terms of spectral channels, Pleiad Neo will acquire simultaneously the pan uh, chromatic channels and the six multispectral bands, uh, which are deep blue blue, green, red, red edge, and near inf inf infrared. The red edge and, and deep blue are two new additional bands on, on PNEO compared to its predecessor, Pleiad and Spot, which were four bands. Um, the red edge uh, and deep blue will unveil uh, complementary information uh, where red edge will allow for deeper vegetation analysis and um, the deep blue band for uh, bathymetry applications. Here's a quick look at the product processing combinations and some of the processing options that we offer. Uh, we can deliver data as a bundle where the PAN and the MS are separated or as a PAN sharpen product where we fuse the PAN and the MS to create a natural color image. Uh, we also offer a few different geometric and radiometric processing options to meet more advanced user needs uh, to display ready formats for new users. Um, I won't go into too much detail about um, the product types today, but um, let's go into a little more depth about how the satellite captures imagery. Um, you know, the Pleiade Neo constellation has been optimized to respond to a lot of customer applications. So we've decided to position the satellites in, in quadrature in a sun synchronous uh, near polar orbit at roughly 100, uh, 620 kilometer altitude. So taking into account adequate sun elevation and acquisition angles, the satellite's um, 90 degree orbit offset guarantees visibility over any point on Earth at least twice a day. Uh, depending on the latitude of the area of interest, the revisit can be up to three or four times per day um, with another satellite trailing behind to capture imagery at um, around 10.30 a.m. local time. And this 90 degree phasing has several benefits. It ensures regularity of revisit, um, which makes it easy for you to organize your operations. It means that every day within the same window, a uh, PNEO satellite will fly over your AOI. Um, this will make your change detection tasks easier. You'll be able to compare images taken at the same hours of the day and ensures um, uh, to cover the entire globe, even at extreme latitudes. And when adding our legacy Pleiad and Spot satellites, you'll, you can acquire uh, over your AI between four to seven times a day at varying resolutions. Uh, this animation shows the orbitology of the, const of the PNEO constellation. Uh, the satellites fly from a north to south direction around the globe um, and the images are taken on the descending orbit when the sun is illuminating the target illuminating the earth and the satellite ascends when it's on the dark side of the earth this example shows um, the satellite field over a target in baku azerbaijan at 40 degrees north latitude the white dotted line is the satellite ground track and the orange concentric circle uh, are the field of views over the target where the smaller orange circle shows the opportunities to collect an image with a view angle of 30, less than 30 degrees incidence, and the larger orange at a more oblique, less than 45 degree incidence. In this case, we have access over Baku up to three times a day, 
Um, the tasking plan is sent to the satellite. Each time the satellite passes over a polar station and a new request can be integrated into the plan up to 10 minutes before the satellite passes over the pole. Um, this allows us, allows integration of new requests for urgent acquisitions to consider the latest weather forecasts and focus on areas where success rates are higher. Um, it's got a very impressive uplink and downlink rate. Um, the system is designed to deliver data and acquire in very timely ways. So download is triggered when the crossing visibility circles um, of the core ground stations in Toulouse and Karuna uh, at the North Pole and each orbit, as well as the network of direct receiving uh, partners that we have around the globe are able to so serve local users in, in near real time. Um, and so here's, here's an image of uh, a plan Neo image of uh, Baku, which is the capital, largest city of Azerbaijan, and um, a, a a view at pollution at one to one here. Uh, these are the flame, uh, the famous landmark, the flame towers in in Baku uh, that light up. I believe they have LED screens that display uh, visible uh, 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 presentations all around the city. Um, this video shows how one satellite executes an acquisition plan on a single orbit over Europe. Um, so the satellite's maneuverability makes possible various acquisition modes adapted to a, a large range of mission requirements. Um, the standard north to south image strips uh, with a 14 kilometer swath will be suitable for mapping, most mapping applications, while target mode will fix defense intelligence or natural disaster requests. Uh, in addition to capturing single images, stereo mode will also allow, also allow us to generate digital elevation and 3D modeling products, like digital uh, surface models, digital terrain models. Uh, each of the four satellites is extremely agile thanks to the uh, in-house manufacturer controlled moment gyroscope, CMGs, that enable the spacecraft to quickly slew left and right one or more images. Um, with the four identical sats, phase 90 degrees from each other, you know, operating in this orbit plate uh, can, can collect at least twice a day. And this agility um, acquisition modes and optimized planning is um, allows us to fulfill a lot of customer needs on time. Um, looking at um, PMEO's coverage capacity, if you add the revisit capacity to the agility of the satellites, the constellation is able to acquire up to 2 million square kilometers a day, that's 500,000 square kilometers per satellite. And each satellite can collect up to 7,500 um, square kilometers, uh, multiple image strips in a single pass, and up to 15,000 square kilometers using two satellites um, with consistent coverage within a day, which is quite impressive. So this guarantees um, consistency uh, for, wide, for wide area coverage. Um, let's talk about clouds. Clouds are a hurdle when it comes to monitoring activities on Earth with electro-optical sensors. Um, the Pleiades Neo weather forecast has been dramatically improved compared to previous generations. So accurate weather prediction is updated um, at and for each orbit. More precisely, uh, a global weather forecast is updated four times a day, complemented with a local prediction update on each orbit. Um, thanks to this improvement, we estimate that 70% of our data collected will contain less than 10% cloud cover. Um, as a comparison, this rate of 50% for, for the previous mission, PLAID, which was significant. But um, uh, this performance fosters two basic requirements, which are extracting useful information and getting data on time, essentially. Uh, there, it'll, it will enhance our tasking success rate and, and, and rapid delivery included um, in our standard tasking offer, where, where we commit to provide you, you coverage of your AOI with a threshold threshold value of under 10% cloud cover over your project area. Um, speaking about speed, um, addressing tasking reactivity, both in terms of mission program and delivery work plans are updated every time the satellite enters into an S-band uplink contact, uh, be it every 25 minutes. Uh, it, it, it takes about 100 minutes for the satellite to orbit, uh, about an hour and 40 minutes, and that's 15 times per day per satellite, and it represents about 60 plans uploaded every day with the full four ball constellation. So uh, the work plans are also pooled. This means that when an image is collected by one satellite, the related acquisition request is removed from the tasking plans of the other satellites. Um, these multiple and synchronized work plans per day enable really easily 
easy handling of last minute requests, which can be placed up to 15 minutes before the S band contact, as well as an integration of latest weather information for uh, improved data collection success rates. So um, reactivity can be uh, improved by leveraging uh, a direct receiving station in the field. Some of our customers own and operate a direct receiving station. In this case, tasking plans can be uploaded 10 minutes before the S-band uplink, and the satellites can acquire an area and download the telemetry simultaneously to the antenna. This greatly reduces the delivery lead time as it becomes close to near real time. Um, overall, you can expect to receive an image between 25 minutes to two hours um, after placing a tasking plan with a direct receiving station, depending on the AOI and the reception mode. Um, this architecture that we built for PNEO is brand new. It's cloud-based. It's got a massive image production capacity uh, with immediate processing and access to image products um, with a large network of DRSs. So with, with the DRS, um, this is kind of the, you know, showing here concept of operations for customers who own their direct receiving station. They can send the tasking plan. The tasking plan is uploaded via command link. Uh, it images and it downlinks to the customer DRS um, and then delivers to the end user. And in this case, you're looking at about an hour and 13 minutes. Uh, this DRS ConOps results in an average delivery timeline of around an hour after the tasking plan was submitted. For, um, for those who don't own and operate a DRS, we offer a more standard tasking timeline for virtual reception service and uh, similar workflow, but the CONOP is a little bit different. Tasking request, tasking plan goes up to the satellite. Uh, it's imaged and it's, it's brought down to a, an Airbus uh, DRS before it's produced and delivered to a customer. And um, the VRS CONOPs result in an average delivery timeline of around two hours after the tasking plan was submitted. So that's the satellite um, imaging capability, a little bit on the product, but um, next I wanna just talk a little bit of our platform. You need a reliable and trustworthy uh, partner, but you also need data quickly and easily. So our cloud-based digital platform called One Atlas helps uh, connect imagery from space to, to make decisions uh, on Earth. So One Atlas is a unique place to, to quickly and easily access updated imagery layers. Um, One Atlas offers flexible and easy, constantly updated archive imagery, as well as state-of-the-art tasking solutions to acquire the freshest data through a, a web interface or through APIs. Um, One Atlas provides access to multi-source, multi-resolution data. Um, we have something called the Living Library, which allows you to download and stream data instantaneously. Um, we also have a base map, which is a worldwide layer. Um, produced from our highest grade satellite imagery and it's constantly refreshed. Uh, it adapts to your workflows. You can stream it into your GIS or access it through API or download it into your own system. Um, and base map can be used as a contextual layer. Uh, One Atlas also provides access to digital elevation models, the WorldDem uh, and the WorldDem for Ortho via streaming for 3D analytics, um, uh, generating value added information. And finally, thanks to our uh, analytics offer, um, you can monitor your uh, AOIs across time and, and apply powerful analysis solutions focused on both Airbus um, algorithms or third party, party type algorithms, uh, focusing on infrastructure, land use change and activity level me measurement through um, uh, feature extraction and, and vehicle counting, cars, trucks, uh, ships, planes, based on archive imagery and, and tasking capabilities. Um, Here's how it works. I was going to do a live demo, but uh, uh, I, I put together just a few slides. Here is a, um, an AOI I generated over Vancouver, and you can query the archive and find an image that covers your area of interest. You can stream that right in the portal or, or, or do this through API if you want to automate this workflow. Um, you can uh, stream that imagery out to your favorite GIS in a um, in, in a, in, in a, as a web service, as a, you know, OGC compliant endpoints, um, or you could download the product and work with it locally within your network and your infrastructure. There, all those processing options are available there. And if the archive isn't fresh enough, you can task over that area. We have basically three plans. The first two are rather premium, one day collect on a specific day since we have daily access, um, or uh, 
one now, which is for emergency response, turn on this, the sensor and collect an image as soon as possible. Uh, our most uh, popular plan and most cost efficient plan is one, one plan. Um, and that allows us to deliver uh, coverage within a qualified time frame. Uh, and here's a look at some of the analytics that you can run uh, over your AOI. Um, you know, land use uh, um, classification, you can extract building footprints and roads, um, change detection, obviously, as well as some type of feature extraction, uh, all on demand uh, over, over small project areas. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. These are just a few of the um, uh, markets and uh, use cases uh, for the data that everyone's probably pretty familiar with. So I'm going to, in the essence of time, just wrap up and give um, just a short list of value proposition here with, with, for Playad Neo. Um, so PNEO with the two satellites on orbit and all, all four on orbit by the end of next year, you can acquire multiple 30 centimeter image resolutions over your area, uh, area of interest anywhere uh, on Earth every day. This allows you to closely monitor your critical sites uh, to enhance your change detection algorithms, um, tasking reactivity for highest priority and last minute requests, um, the agility and the collection capacity. It allows us to produce large seamless uh, imagery mosaics of an area and create very high resolution base maps. Um, and, and make, making sure that you're receiving consistent and accurate, you know, accurate imagery. And of course, performing near, near real time tasking and, and download um, use cases. Um, to conclude, uh, here's a nice image of the Dubai Air Show uh, that's going on this week um, in UAE. This was collected on Sunday, right before the show started. You can see all the aircraft on the tarmac there. Um, I thought that was a nice image to show. And we've come to the end, I guess, of the presentation for now, but there's uh, certainly a lot more to talk about. Uh, if you wish uh, to learn more about uh, Pleiad Neo or any Airbus intelligence products, I invite you to visit our website or reach out, reach out to me directly. Um, so thanks for listening. And um, I'm happy to take questions or otherwise enjoy the rest of you, uh, the show this week. Thanks so much for that presentation, Peter. That was very informative on the, the, the NEO satellite. If we have, uh, we do have some questions here. I'm wondering if uh, Catherine is able to join us for these questions. Okay, so let's see. Chris is asking if there are some sample images of any Canadian locations. Yeah. Yeah, we've been actively um, building an archive for the first two satellites that were launched this summer. Uh, we've collected well over um, 50,000 images. It was the last metric I saw, so plenty of coverage in North America. Um, for the most part, a lot of the archive imagery is going to be collected over metro urban areas where, where change is occurring. That's generally where you see the very high resolution being collected, but we also have coverage in the rural and remote areas. Um, we don't have any predefined samples that you can download on our website yet, but we will soon. And, and we can certainly um, tailor a uh, sample uh, archive product um, for your project. So just reach out to me and let me know your area of interest and we'll, we'll do our best to get you a sample. That would be great. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of responses to that. <laughs> and uh, we have another question from the audience uh, as to whether the images will be added to the Canadian National Master standing offer for the uh, space-based imagery? And if so, when will that happen? Great question. Uh, I certainly hope so. That is our intent. Um, we're, we, we've uh, been working with Canada um, in the past. So the idea is to integrate the new um, PlayAd Neo products uh, as we have for, for PlayAd and Spot, our legacy sensors. So uh, I don't have the details around that. Um, if, if you want to reach out to me, I can um, put you in touch with Jen Kennedy. She's the, the, the director of sales for, for that Canada region, and she would be managing that contract. So I, I can get you a little bit more detail around that. Um, I, I would imagine there are a lot of people waiting for this. This is very, like a lot of people are going to be very interested in this. And um, the final question that we seem to have is if you can ballpark the investment that Airbus has made in this constellation, 
in the Pleiades constellation, the overall. Oh my, yeah. So, I mean, building a satellite program can be upwards of, you know, 500 uh, um, billion dollars per satellite. That's including building the satellite, building the rockets, launching them, building the ground segment. Uh, it's very costly. And these are large format, exquisite satellites. Um, of course, you know, we've, we're in an age of where everyone's launching, uh, you know, swarms of satellites now. They're smaller, a little bit less capable, and the life expectancy is a little shorter on orbit, um, but they're easily replaceable. But these large format satellites are expensive. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a significant investment um, showing how important geospatial is to, to Airbus uh, defense and space at the intelligence level. Well, it really is. It's important to, in so many different aspects. Okay, that seems to be, this is your last chance to ask any further questions for Peter. Um, and uh, it doesn't look like we have any more coming in. So we'll thank you for your presentation, Peter. And we will see, has anyone been sent to this room to replace Jay Pablo for the multi-scale Earth observations panel? Uh, sorry, presentation. It sometimes happens and I don't see Jay Pablo here. So I'm guessing we're going to just end this session here. I'd certainly like to thank Jeff uh, Burbridge uh, from Airbus Defense and Space, as well as Peter Barron from Airbus Defense and Space for uh, presenting here this afternoon in this uh, Earth Observations 3 session. And we will wrap this session early, which will give everyone here a chance to go and see the 3B session, which is most likely still going. And um, after that, we invite everyone to uh, certainly join us for the James Webb Space Telescope panel starting at uh, 1530 this afternoon. There's going to be some very interesting stuff there. And thank you all for joining. We're so glad we, you could make it. Enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you all.